Well, I think, suppose like uh, most other people my age, it was the, the Kingston Trio and groups of that type that brought acoustic guitar and banjo and all the other uh, traditional instruments uh, to everybody's attention. Uh, and I f fell in love with that kind of music and uh, got a guitar when I was 14. And, uh, you know, started learning, you know, fa songs out of uh, folk books. And then I got to hear people like uh, Bob Gibson uh, and uh, Pete Seeger. Uh, and then uh, somebody loaned me a Gary Davis record, and I just... I basically, uh, I, it knocked my socks off. I mean, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And uh, by that time, I was finger-picking a bit, uh, so I just kept on, I mean, I wore this guy's record out, you know, uh, just trying to figure out what Gary was doing. And uh, I did figure it out after a fashion, but later on when I played what I'd, you know, done with his music uh, for him, he, uh, he just laughed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, he 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 was he was very gentle about it, uh, and uh, he was uh, uh, he was kind enough to to show me what he was doing. I mean, I had no idea until he told me that uh, he would never ever do anything with a capo on. So something that he did in D uh, with a particular voicing, he wasn't using a capo to get like everybody else was. He was actually fingering that voicing. So it was a big eye opener. I'm trying to think. I think it was 1964, if I'm correct. Uh, he was booked to play the coffee house that I hung out at. It was the place was called the Retort Coffee House. It was on Woodward Avenue uh, in like near downtown Detroit. It was more like the Wayne State University area, uh, and it was in the basement of um, a uh, hotel. Uh, and uh, the owner asked me if I would like to uh, be Gary's opener. And I went, yeah, <laughs> you know, twist my arm. <laughs> so I was in junior high at the time and I was taking finals. And I'd go and I'd take my finals. And at that time, when you're done with finals at my school, you could leave the grounds. You didn't have to stick around. So my finals were all uh, in the early part of the day. So. By one o'clock, I was done taking the tests, and I would just, you know, uh, leave the building, hop on the bus, go home, uh, have something to eat, and uh, get ready to go uh, and hang out with Gary. And Gary and I would uh, just hang out in his room because he was staying uh, in the hotel. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I'd listen to him play and he'd listen to me play and, um, uh, and, uh, we'd talk and, and, uh, his wife Annie was there. So, uh, you know, basically it was, uh, it was a great time. I got my entire music education, not my guitar education, but my music education was in the Detroit public school system. The big three were, you know, they were like... Uh, King Kong, Godzilla, and Rodan all rolled into one when it came to m making money, and they weren't stingy with it, especially the Ford Foundation, and they spent money on the fine arts uh, departments uh, in the Detroit public school system big time. And um, so there was that. There was also the fact that um, uh, I listened, music was part of my daily life as a listener from classical music to um, popular music of the day. And then uh, when folk music hit, a, a big, you know, sizable folk community uh, grew up in Detroit. So there was all those influences, plus the pop influence in Motown especially. And I had a group of friends who were also pickers at the time. And we had a game of who could come up with the most complete arrangement on one guitar of what we were hearing on Top 40 radio. So, um, so the aspect of how to get the elements of pop music and R&B uh, and, uh, you know, that sort of like was born there as far as I was concerned. That's where I picked it up. And uh, Detroit also was in a great 
place geographically because people were coming and going from the East Coast and the West Coast and performing and leaving their mark in the area. And then, you know, they'd go away. So the people that heard that stuff the, would pick it up and they'd put their own little twist on it. So that's what we did. Um, so uh, it was, you know, uh, I have to admit that when I was really a diehard folky and, and uh, country blues person, I discounted a lot of the popular music, even though that I was messing around with it. I didn't think much of it at the time because it wasn't, you know, it w I had tunnel vision. When I moved to Los Angeles in 1969, um, at some point uh, while I was there, I realized that I had missed out on something and that I shouldn't have discounted that music because I would hear it uh, on oldie stations um, and realize that this is good stuff and I should pay, you know, and then I started to even pay more attention to it. And then I began, you know, doing sessions and I had to, and I started incorporating what I was hearing on the sessions uh, into my playing and I would you know, and at some point I stopped listening to other guitar players almost all together and just listening to the ensembles and trying to distill the ensembles into this. So that's sort of like the, the arc of, of Rick Ruskin. And all the time I have to go back to Reverend Gary Davis who taught me, even if he did it unknowingly, but he did teach me how not to think like a guitar player because I don't believe he thought like a guitar player. He thought like an orchestrator. Whatever it is he wanted to have behind his voice when he sang, that's what he put together on guitar. And I'm doing, uh, in my mind, much the same thing, only the genre is different. You know, so but I can always hearken back to uh, to the the stuff that he showed me uh, and uh, and what I just picked up by by listening and watching him.